You ready to do this, Brita? I'm ready, Spence. Punch it, Chewy. Welcome, super friends, to the Fortress of Nerditude podcast, a safe place to talk about all things in nerd and pop culture. I'm Spencer Stapleton, and my co-pilot tonight is Brita Stapleton. Hello! We're two nerds that just refuse to grow up. Thank you for joining us. This is episode 135. We release every Thursday morning. You can find us at the website, fortinerd.com. There's links there to iTunes, Google Music, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts are available. Stop by and relax a while. If you like what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button and get us automatically each and every week in your ear holes. Brita, you're back on the podcast. You're back in the Fortress of Nerditude, episode 135. It's a movie club. How are you doing tonight, my dear? I'm good. I'm very tired, as per usual, but uh, I'm good. I'm excited to be back. Nice. So tell the super friends what you've been up to lately, what's going on in your life. I feel like mostly what's been happening is a lot of parenting. So mm. we've, we've, our children are not bad children. They just have bad moments. And I feel like we've had a number of them lately. They're little boys. <laughs> yes. And I don't know if it's just like, it's summer. They feel like they want to do other things. They're getting bored. And their day to day is just the same. They go to daycare every day and, you know, that kind of a thing. But we've had a few incidents, mostly involving food, apparently, that have uh, riled me up some, to say the least. <laughs> so um, a couple weeks ago, Jackson decided he didn't want what I made for dinner, which was homemade mac and cheese people. Like, who doesn't want to eat homemade mac and cheese? I'll, I'll tell you who doesn't want to eat that. Little kids that have only had craft their entire <sighs> life. I don't know. They like it sometimes, and then other times they totally hate it, and this time they didn't like it, and it's the same way I make it all the time. And people, it was delicious. Trust me. It was you very know what good. This, I'll tell you a secret, Brita. This yeah. is something maybe you haven't seen me do, because I do it a lot on the weekend mornings when you're still uh, taking a time to sleep. Mm-hmm. Bacon. Put bacon in it. They will eat anything that has bacon in it. There you go. Yeah, so... Jackson decided he didn't want to eat that for dinner and whatever else I put with it. I'm sure it was some sort of fruit or vegetables. And so while I was upstairs, not near him, he threw it in the garbage can, thinking I wouldn't know. However, I am not a dummy, and I can hear the garbage bag rustling when I know he hasn't eaten his food yet. And I immediately walked out to the stairs and said, what are you doing? And he turns and stares at me and just pauses like a deer in the headlights. (laughs) He's like, I don't know. (laughs) So that caused a super fun parenting moment. And I did not yell and scream, but I talked very sternly to him and gave him a huge lecture about why we don't throw food away. And that there are children all over the world who don't get to eat food. And then she made him eat the food from the trash. I did not. (laughs) But I got more food out and made him eat that anyway. I didn't pull it out of the garbage can. But... Um, cause yeah, the garbage was not, if it had been empty, the, I probably would have That would have sent a real message though. That yeah. would have sent a real message. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it had been empty, but it was quite full and would have been difficult to dig out all the little bits of macaroni and cheese. But true, then, true. then a week later, they're eating spaghetti and meatballs for dinner. And, you know, I cut up the mac, the, uh, spaghetti because long, big noodles cause messes and children tend to choke on that because they don't know how to chew before they swallow. And I hear the kids playing and laughing and eating their food, and I think everything is fine. Oh, stupid mom. What was I thinking? Jackson comes downstairs in his little white shirt that has, like, Buzz Lightyear costumey stuff on it is covered in spaghetti sauce. Not just the front, the back is covered in spaghetti sauce. And I was like, what happened? He said, oh, Charlie was throwing spaghetti at me. Hmm. Yeah, well, you were playing Apex right then. 
and I knew you were online with some of your friends, so I immediately marched the kids upstairs so I could give them a talking to. Same thing with Charlie gave this, him. This is this is code for I took them upstairs to yell at them, but I didn't <laughs> want Spencer's friends to hear through the headset. Exactly. Once again, I didn't <laughs> yell. I talked sternly. Uh-huh. <laughs> but Gave him the same lecture about there are children who don't get to eat food and how would they feel if you they saw you throwing all this perfectly good food in the trash and we don't throw money in the garbage can. Why would you throw food in the garbage can? Because it takes money to buy food and like, you know, the whole big whatever thing. And he was just standing there and So you're, you're trying to explain and... the economics <laughs> to him? Well, you know, he understands Daddy and that- Mommy work really, really hard for this money, <laughs> and that money buys food, and that food's what you need to eat to live. And there's kids that are starving in China. Uh Well, not exactly like that, but he understands that money buys toys that he wants. So Uh when I explain he's throwing that money and so he doesn't get toys and treats, that registers. So that's what I've been up to. Nice. Yeah. I guess. Maybe. (laughs) Hey, they're your kids. You wanted boys. I wanted boys. You wanted kids. So really, who's to blame? You. You were to blame. And you tell me all the time that you chose boys. Uh, oh, that's true. I, I did want boys. I did not want girls. But you wanted kids just period. So You did too. It's fine. I wanted, Continue. <laughs> um, one maybe? I don't know. Uh, I love my children and I'm glad we have them. I know. Um, which there, there are those moments as, a, as like a father. Uh, over, the, over the weekend, I had to go back to Best Buy. And this whole little story. So basically... I'll, I'll tell you that in a second, but I had, uh, but I took Jackson with me by himself and like, he just stood with me in line in customer service and was completely quiet. And I, and I recognized that at one point that he'd been uh, like extremely quiet the entire time. He hadn't interrupted me once. He hadn't bugged me once. And I looked down and I said, Jackson, you're being, you're being really quiet and you're being really good for daddy while daddy's trying to work through this issue. I said, thank you. And he just looked at me and smiled. And then he did the little, you know, zipper across the mouth motion <laughs> and then pretended to throw away the key and then just smiled and gave me a thumbs up. And I was like, ah. And so as we were nearing the end of the customer service experience, I looked down and I said, hey, buddy, because you've been really, really good, we'll go look at some of the DVDs and movies. And he goes, oh, can we? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so we walk over and we look, but, you know, I didn't buy anything, but. I did promise we'll look. And he looked and pointed out a whole bunch of movies that we already had. And and he thought that was great. I love splitting the boys up and taking one boy with me to do something. Right. Uh, because we don't get a lot of that time because the boys are only 16 months apart in age. So usually they want to do everything together. Uh, All the but time. Oca- yeah. Yeah. Every, everywhere we go, everything we do. But occasionally we get to split them apart and get a little one-on-one time. and And that was really nice. Now. The flip side of that experience <laughs> is the story part. So, super friends, let me spin you a tale and 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 uh, listen and learn from my mistakes. So, a number of years ago, I bought a pair of Bose wired headsets that I absolutely love. I keep them in my ears all day long at work, at home, because I make phone calls with them. I listen to podcasts and audio books and music on them. Um, it's also the way that I listen into conference calls and do conference calls with work stuff. Uh, they're just in my ears nonstop. They're super, super comfortable. Yeah. They got the little wings so they stay inside my ear. I can ride my motorcycle with them. Love them, love them, love them. I was smart enough years ago. I'm, I'm talking like five or six years ago when I bought them. And I remember because they were $150 at the time. And it was like the most expensive e- uh, earbuds that I'd ever purchased. Uh, I got the service plan on them. Well, because I wear them all the time, day in and day out, at about the year mark of having them, something breaks. The plug will snap, the the cable will become loose and frayed, and so the audio will start popping in and out. One of the speakers will blow or something like that. And because I have the service plan on them, I just go back to Best Buy, exchange them for a new pair, get the new service plan, which is like normally like 20, 30 bucks, uh, and then go again. And they've had a couple price drops. They were 150 and then a few years back ago, they dropped to 100 And so they gave out on me uh, this weekend. So I originally went to Best Buy, and I said, okay, I'm going to swap them, but I'm going to get the new 
Bluetooth wireless ones that don't, you know, they just kind of go in your ears, but there's no cable that connects them. There's no horse collar thing you got to wear. And I'll give them a try, see how they work, because I'm getting a little tired of having to constantly plug a cable into my phone. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to kind of, you know, do the whole Bluetooth thing. Well, I get them home and I realize they're so big because they have to have all the Bluetooth stuff in them that they hang further out of my ears than I thought. So I didn't really care for how they looked. Then also, occasionally the left audio would go out. It would like pop in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And then it would reestablish. Come to find out that the Bluetooth pushes from the phone to the right ear. And then the right ear pushes it over to the left ear. So you can get a little bit of a lag. And you can get this kind of like a syncing issue between the two. And they said, you know, a firmware update will help with that, but not make it go away. Then to further the issue, if you take a phone call, it only goes in your right ear, not in both. And my, I'm a little hard of hearing. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of loud music in my ears and co- rock concerts and such. Um, that if there's like a lot of noise going on around me, like there's a lot of background noise, people can be real close talking to me and I start struggling to pay attention because there's just too much ambient noise going on and I can't focus in. Uh, Brita also accuses me of having select hearing. I just hear what I want to hear. And eh, maybe that's true. I it's filter true. out things that I filter out things <laughs> that don't interest me sometimes. Um, so all these kind of things combined and the fact that I paid like an additional $150 to upgrade to them, I just wasn't satisfied. So I went back the next day and I, this is, and this is when I took Jackson, I went back the next day and I said, you know what? This isn't what I want. It's not hitting me right. Uh, I want to exchange these back, just get the same ones I had and, you know, the service plan and get refunded the extra 150 I put in, swap it across and call it good. Best Buy says, fine, no problem. Except, wait a minute, they only have the iPhone version. They don't have the Samsung slash Android version. Mm-hmm. And so they look around, they don't have it. Then they look on their website, find out they don't even carry it anymore. So the guy tries to, you know, show me some Jaybirds and Jabra and uh JBL stuff and he's trying to like sell me on a couple of these other ones that are wireless but they have the cord between them or they have the horse collar. The problem is is I don't want the horse collar because I know I'm not going to wear that. And the ones with the little wire between them I maybe I'd be okay with them. But the the one the other ones I had that I purchased and tried they came with like a little case and so you could charge them in the case and then take the case with you so when they ran out of a charge you toss them back in the case, which acts as a battery. It would charge them back up again. You could toss them in and go for another five hours. When that ran out, you could toss them in the case at one last time and charge them for another five hours. So essentially, if you charged everything up at night, you could have 15 hours of playtime throughout the day with, you know, two-hour intervals twice in there uh, to, to charge. These other ones, I'd just have to charge, and then when they go dead, I have to plug them back into a cable. There's no, like, quick battery, charge, whatever. And so I kind of felt like I needed more time to look because I'm very specific. I need to be able to ride my motorcycle with them. I need to be able to hear well enough. And these Bose ones kind of channel into my ears, but they don't block out all of the noise around me. And I've got years, like five, six years of experience with them. I know those are comfortable. I I wear them and I don't even notice I'm wearing them most of the time. Right. So they say, well, we can refund you the money then. Because I didn't want to purchase them. I was like, fine, okay. And so they start kind of going through the refund process. And they say, oh, well, we're going to refund like 180 some dollars to the card you you know, you know upgraded with yesterday. Then the other 67 bucks or whatever is going to get refunded to this other card. And they gave me the last four digits. And they said, do you still have that card? And I said, no. And they said, do you know like what bank that was from? I said, no, no clue. Because a number of years ago, Braden and I started getting real serious about paying off debt. We started closing credit cards we had. Mm -hmm. We closed some extra bank accounts we had. Uh, We really just tightened up our finances and, you know, been eliminating debt uh, to the point now that all we have in the way of debt is student loan and the mortgage. No credit card debt, you know, which we had multiple credit cards at one point. And we had car payments and we had payments for like furniture. Like it was just, we made some bad choices in the past and- We're in a much better place now. So I said, no, I don't have this. And they said, okay, well, 
okay, well, it's supposed to go to this. You'd have to find out what that bank is and then contact them and then get the bank to cut you a check. I was like, that's not going to work. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And they said, well, that's kind of how our system works. They said, or we could put it on a gift card. I said, fine. Assuming that we were still talking about refunding the main portion to my current debit card that's attached to my checking, and then the remainder goes to the to the gift card. So they process all the thing, wait a couple more minutes, and then they hand me a big receipt with one uh, gift card. And I said, okay, great. I said, so this is the 68. I said, no, it's the full $248 and change. Yeah. And I was like, wait, wait, what? And they said, yeah, <laughs> in order to do this, we had to put it all onto a gift card. So essentially... I paid $150 to upgrade these things, and then I ended up getting that locked into a gift card. So if you purchase something on a card from Best Buy and you intend to get a refund, uh, something on the service plan, and they're not offering anymore, and they'll refund you the money, if you if it's with an old account, something you don't have anymore, the only way they can give it to you is a gift card. So... I now have $250 basically locked into a Best Buy gift card that I have to spend there. That's the bad news. The good news is I have half of my down payment for the PS5 in like a year, year and a half hmm. ready to go. So, Or I have a new vacuum. Uh, well, I mean, that's an idea. It's, it's a valid idea, but it probably won't be the way we go. Um, just knowing how things work. But hmm. we'll see. We'll see. Uh, anyway, it, it was a bit of a... It was a bit of a thing, but uh, it was just frustrating. Yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, let's see. Other than that, uh, rented a movie on Redbox. Never done that before. Used my little <laughs> Father's Day gift code. Uh, that was something new that happened. I was like, oh, look, it's a DVD. I haven't rented one of these since 2006. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. It's It's been a while. Um, did that, and then also... Uh, I started playing Apex Legends, like, I think right after we started recording last week. And after talking with Patrick Novosel and a few others, uh, I jumped onto that and I've been listening to Apex Legends podcasts and reading stuff and playing. And I'm getting better, but I still feel like there's a ways to go, but I'm really enjoying the game and kind of what it has to offer. And the fact I can just kind of jump in play for a little bit, get a couple matches in, and then I can jump right back out. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it's a first-person Battle Royale shooter versus kind of the Fortnite, which are like third-party uh, shooters, so a little different. Uh, and then also, Brita, you and I finished Star Trek Discovery this week. Yeah, season two. The, season two, yeah, we which did. was really, really good. I... I I felt like the first season had some more like harder like twists and turns and some more like the unexpected. The second season felt a little more kind of traditional storytelling. There yeah, was less it had more like, of a straightforward arc to it. Yeah, but it, I thought it was a really really good story and it was a lot of fun yeah. throughout. It's still and, and uh, it still had like twists to it and um some things you weren't expecting and and I really like what happened and it did leave us hanging at the end, basically. Spoiler alert, Brita. Well, Star Trek was <laughs> like hanging. It, uh, it did Not get renewed spoiler. for a third season, so we do know a third season will be coming down the pipe. Also, that Star Trek Picard series is coming later this year, so I'm excited yeah. for that. Nice. But anyway, so that's kind of been my week uh, in a nutshell. Brita, what do you say? Is it time to kill some Bothans? Let's go murder those Bothans. I always have to let you know, many Bothans died to bring us this information. Rest in peace, you Bothans. All right, Brita, we're into Rebel Intelligence. What do you have for me this week? So there's actually a, a prequel of Hunger Games that um, is supposed to be coming out next year. Um, Suzanne Collins, the author of The Hunger Games, is working on um, a new uh, book that takes place um, like about 64 years before the events of the original series um, of books. And so it's basically supposed to be about 10 years after the big war when everything becomes Panem together. 
and it's like the tenth Hunger Games. So pretty much no one we know of in the Hunger Games series will be in this because everyone it's before. What about before. that old lady Mags that was in it? Um, Wasn't she from like that around that time? She was, but she was from the eleventh Hunger Games. Oh, so, so this, this is like this a is year before, before her. Yeah, near before her. So you probably won't even. I'm assuming you're not going to hear of her at all because why would you? She hasn't even been chosen. She, she was like the champion that made it in that one. And so she returned in the second book, right? Because right. it was like the champions all return or whatever. Yeah. For like the 75th anniversary or whatever it is, 65th yeah. anniversary, something. So do you think, do you think she's setting this novel in front of that just so she doesn't have to like try to find a way to pigeonhole in. Yeah. And we already know that Mags wins it in that one. So. Right. Yeah. So it's just a totally separate time when like the people are trying to like figure out everything. They're still trying to get their lives back together after this big war. Um, it's technically like it's called the dark days of Pan Am. Um, mm. when this takes place. So it's going to be totally new characters, a totally new... I don't know if it's going to come from, like, one person's point of view, kind of like um, like the Hunger Games did, where it's all about Katniss. I don't know if it's going to be about one particular person or if it's going to be, like, a whole story about a bunch of people. They haven't really talked about it, but it's supposed to come out in May of next year, and they actually already kind of in talks on making a movie as well. Well, I mean, of course, with how big the Hunger Games movies were. Right. How would you, why yeah. would you not do that? Let me ask you a question. Yes. You going to read this book? Absolutely. Really? I loved I, the Hunger Games. Uh, so here's the thing. I love the story of the Hunger Games, mm-hmm. and I love the idea of the Hunger Games. I don't exactly care for Suzanne Collins' writing. Mm. There was a lot of times where, and and I noticed this heavily when listening to the audio book, her writing, she kind of like writes up to an event and then something happens like a grenade goes off and then the next chapter starts and it's been like a day or two and the person mm. took this concussion right as the big battle was starting to take place and then that point of view character is knocked out for the next two days and then that character comes back to consciousness and then you kind of find out a little bit about what happened in kind of a quick summary, like, oh, it was intense firefighting, and then it was over fast. We barely managed to pull you out of there. And it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. Like, you had this opportunity to, like, tell this really kind of cool scene or this battle. And I felt like she did that over and over and over again, like, wrote up to a thing. Mm-hmm. And then right as it was starting to get good, then she cuts away to an easy thing. And I, for me... It definitely felt like this, like it was very much a a YA book. Right. And there wasn't a lot of, uh, I don't want to say difficult writing, but maybe world building in a way that, you know, you could tell, you know, bigger scenes and whatnot. So while I really, really like the overall kind of story and the idea of of the Hunger Games and and some of the kind of the concepts and themes... I really struggled to get through like that, especially that third book uh, of hers in that series. It just it felt the book felt so kind of stale compared to the others. I don't know if I want to if I want to read this or if I just want to say, hey, when the movie comes out, I'll go see the movie right. because then it'll at least, you know, kind of chop out all the poor writing and it'll just be, you know, kind of an actiony adventure type of movie. Yeah, well, I mean, these are YA novels, so that's probably a lot of why a lot of it is, quote unquote, off screen. Um, yeah. They don't get too nitty gritty in some of that violence and stuff. Um, but I'm I'm so excited about it, especially because like I'm hoping there's a little bit more world building in this because we don't we get a brief history of what happened um, with the yeah. war and how it became Pan Am and all that kind of stuff. But I'm hoping with this one being closer to when the war happened and people still recovering and, you know, not adjust their lives aren't totally adjusted yet from that, that we might get more, more detailed information about that, you know, and get a a richer picture of this world. So that's my Mm. hope, but I like them. I'm, I'm, I'll read them. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to start off with, uh, something I think is kind of an inevitable, uh, Avengers Endgame. We yes. know is close to hitting that 2.7, it's like 
seven seven two point seven eight billion dollar threshold right. the record that's held by avatar adventures end game is like a little under 50 million away from topping that mark right and so uh they are going to re-release back to theaters Avengers Endgame with new footage mm. to entice fans to go back out and to see it one more time before they pull it. Now, uh, on record, Kevin Feige has, has definitely said that this is not new footage that's going to be like interspersed throughout the movie. So it's not like a recut of the movie. Not like an extended but- version. No, it's not an extended version. It's not a recut of the movie, uh, which technically then would kind of qualify it a little bit different. But they're basically going to be uh, adding on uh, and kind of in a scene or an extended scene or two uh, at the end of the credits, oh. which which will extend the length of the movie a little bit. Uh, obviously, we know that if you watched it, there was a little something... Uh, all the Spider-Man Far From Home kind of previews and whatnot had to be held off until after Avengers Endgame because of the events of Avengers Endgame and what was going to happen there. Right. So now they're going to be adding that onto the end, plus some other things that they say is going to extend it and is going to, you know, is going to entice fans that, you know, fans are really going to want to see this. There's some radical far out Things some people think that we're gonna see Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards show up. Uh, you know, some people are saying that it could be a possible X Men thing, mm-hmm. and I think that's only because now Disney actually has Fox, right? Uh, 20th Century Fox, and so they think it's gonna be that. I don't think that's gonna be that at all because that you would have to hire and cast those roles so dang quick. And then in order to film something to lead into something, I don't think we're going to see any of those characters for four or five years down the road. Right. What I think, what I think it is, is it's going to be a longer cut of a trailer from or a scene from Spider-Man Far From Home, yeah. or potentially it could be something from one of the other Marvel properties, Black Panther, Doctor Strange. But my money is on more Peter Parker. Tom Holland's Peter Parker from uh, Far From Home. But what it's going to do is it's going to give uh, Marvel a chance to basically top that record. I mean, they're so dang close that they want to get that and they want to set the all-time box office record. They're looking at maybe the 4th of July weekend. They haven't ex- especially come out and said for sure, but it is going to come back out for like one weekend so you're going to have to go and see it on that weekend in order to get that. Um, I know a lot of people, Brita Online, are saying, like, this kind of seems dumb. They're just trying to do this just to get money and just to break a record. But it's like, yeah, but a movie like Avatar was in the theater for like nine months. And that got re-released two or three different times back to the theater. Like, here's your chance if you missed this to go back and see it again. And they would do that. And that counted all for their total, you know, cumulative box office take does this make sense to you i mean they're that close yeah do you see this just as a cash grab or do you see this as being anything other than that oh no i think it's just a like he wants that record like that's what it seems like to me he's like okay we're almost there if we put this out one more time we can make it that extra few million bucks to get this especially if we say oh there's new content that's gonna be on there and you know so i mean are you gonna go See this just for uh, end credit scenes? Yes, <laughs> for t- for two reasons. One is I want to see if there if it is something other than Spider-Man Far From Home. Yeah. That that could be very very telling as to the next phase of the MCU. But also I want to see it beat Avatar. The only oh, yeah. reason Avatar got that record is because everyone says, oh, this movie is so beautiful in 3D, blah, blah, blah. But the story is absolute garbage. Well, it's and, Mongolian space. I mean, it's Pocahontas in it's, space. It's you know, the it's, same story, yeah. Exactly. But Avengers Endgame is a massive, huge success. And it's doing this in such a short period of time. Uh, I'm okay going back and seeing it another time yeah. to try to help get over there because I'll use my AMC 
uh, you know, Stubbs A list thing, and it's you know gonna just it's gonna count for their their box office, but it's not gonna cost me any extra money. Right. So. So what I want to see is I I agree that it might be a far you know Spider Man Far From Home. I want to see more of a an extended uh Thor with the uh, the Asgardians of the galaxy. Yeah. Of what's happening on the on their ship after they leave. That's well, what I want. And see. we know <laughs> we know they're getting ready to film. I think. They're getting ready to go into production on that movie, so I doubt it'll be anything there. But, I mean, maybe they filmed some other stuff that they just didn't use that got That's, cut out. Yeah, so exactly. You never know. You never so, anyway. All right. Big money for Disney. Yep, always. All right, so I have something rather interesting. So, you know, in uh, also with Avengers Endgame... Uh, Tony Stark, after the whole everything, five years down the road, he's living in this awesome little cabin in the woods, right? Yeah. Well, now you can also stay in Tony Stark's after Endgame cabin. It, really? It is actually listed on Airbnb. Oh, of course. Of course. Sure. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's a little cabin outside of, uh, Oh, my mind just blanked. Atlanta? Yeah, it's outside of, okay. outside of the Atlanta airport area. It's somewhere out there. And, and um, someone found it listed on Airbnb and started, like, posting something, you know, made memes and things like that. Well, the people, someone called to confirm, like, was this the cabin that was used in the movie? And they're like, yeah. Well, it was originally listed for three thirty five a night. Okay. And now since there's been buzz about this and people have realized what it is and the owners have realized, oh, wait, we can cash in on this. It's now $800 uh -oh. a night. Yikes. Really? Yeah. So, uh, and they even like post on there something like, you know, you can recreate the Tony Stark, you know, uh, funeral wreath thing at the end on, with your friends on the dock. <laughs> Which wow. I think is just weird, but whatever. So are they going to provide a funeral pyre that you, we can push out into no. a boat with a flaming arrow? No. And apparently you okay. can't have extra guests and no parties. So, yeah. That would be kind of cool to watch like Avengers Endgame in the cabin. Right? That would be pretty cool. But I don't really so want to pay $800 to do that. Yeah, that's right. $800? <laughs> here's the thing. Five years from now... When that thing is still on Airbnb, mm -hmm. the price will come down because the yeah. movie will have been long gone and people aren't going to – it's kind of like the whole um, – oh, the farmer's field in Iowa that was used for uh, Field of Dreams. Like – Oh, yeah. You – like, you know, they, they plow that farmer, you know, had to plow under his field and do the thing. And eventually he decided to keep the field and people would come and he could charge people and whatnot. And it's just a baseball field. Yeah. That's that. I mean, that's all it is. Now it is cool because that kind of has a little bit of significance, but it, it's just a baseball field. This thing is just a, a cabin. Eventually though, it's going to lose interest and it's going to get cheap. Yeah. Then if it goes back down to three thirty five a night and we're in the Atlanta area, I mean, I'd consider taking some friends or family and doing that, but not for eight hundred dollars. You got to be crazy, right? We need to have like an end game costume party there, where everyone comes and dressed and up and charge as, admission. Yeah, everyone has to dress up like their favorite end game character. We'll watch the movie. It'll be we'll take some pictures, recreate some things. It'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. There you okay. go. Uh, I'm for my next uh, Rebel Intelligence item brita i'm still staying in the marvel universe so like we've kind of stayed with the mcu here yeah. uh pretty much throughout so obviously there's a lot of scuttlebutt about what the next big thing what's going to be you know the next phase of the mcu who are going to be big actors they're going to step in because obviously we got a lot of actors on expiring contracts or contracts that have already expired mm -hmm. um but Kevin Feige has confirmed that there is an actor that they are trying to actively get to step into a role in the MCU, and that actor is Keanu Reeves. Oh, of course. And, and right now, <laughs> Keanu is like, he's hot again, and he's like in all these movies, and you know, John Wick 3, and he's in Toy Story 4, mm -hmm. and just like, he's 
you know, he's kind of, you know, he's got the new Bill and Ted three face the music coming up. I mean, he is just doing a lot of stuff and it kind of seems like he's one of those actors that like, he'll do a bunch of stuff, get real popular. And then his career just will kind of taper off again. And he kind of won't have a lot of big roles. And then all of a sudden it's going through this resurgence again. And they're trying to get Keanu. There is no like actual role that he's been specified as playing or, you know, rumors. But a lot of people are saying like, well, you know, if, you know, if, uh, you know, the Fox stuff comes over, you know, he could be Dr. Doom or, you know, he could be part of Galacticus, you know, if something like that happens or, you know, he could be this or he could be that. No idea if he's even going to be a hero or a villain, but Kevin Feige has said he is trying to get uh, Keanu Reeves nailed down into a role. Nice. How does how does that idea strike you? I mean, I'm not the hugest Keanu Reeves fan. I feel like he's kind of a one note actor to me, and the stuff I've seen him in, he looks the same in everything. I I know you love some of his movies, but uh, I don't know. I, it it's fine either way. I don't care. He's I'm just not a huge Keanu Reeves fan, so it doesn't like pump me up or anything. <laughs> so it is interesting because like some of his earlier work is all very one note stuff, uh, but later on he's done more. I mean, I know they just announced him in Cyberpunk 2077 at E3, and he showed up and told everyone that they're beautiful. Uh, and you know, the internet went crazy cause some guy yells, you know, you're beautiful. And he's like, no, you're all beautiful. And you know, everyone's <laughs> like, ah, they go crazy. Here's the thing though. Like the more and more I see of like what I'm going to call regular Keanu, this is like stuff like there's the video that's been going on forever where he's sitting on the subway in New York and, and he does, he rides a subway, he rides a bike. Um, he just kind of comes across as like the everyman kind of normal Joe and but that video of like him on the subway and he's sitting there and then some lady's kind of walking and she's going to have to like stand and like he gets up and gives his seat to her and you can tell like someone filmed this on their cell phone kind of trying to be discreet and like you see that and it's like this guy is a massive like movie star who has starred in some huge Hollywood blockbusters right. and he's riding the subway and he's giving up his seat for a, for an older lady you know you just kind of get the idea that like He's just kind of that every man and he kind of has that personality. So I'm a big Keanu fan. I love a lot of his movies, even some of the ones that are just bad <laughs> and even his older ones that he's not that great in, yeah. but it's still like, it's still, they're kind of fun, kind of guilty pleasure. Sure. So I'm, I'm okay with Keanu showing up in the MCU in whatever role they want to put him in right now. I mean, I would hate for them to put him in something that's like small and it's like a one film. Like if you're going to make him a villain, make him the equivalent of like Loki where like he's going to appear through multiple movies. Don't make him like some really, really cool villain who's in one movie and then we never see him again. That would be a waste. Do you have a preference of a character for him to play? Oh, I don't know. (sighs) Potentially, I mean, there's things that I go, okay, maybe he could play Reed Richards uh, if they introduce the Fantastic Four. You know, right. he could, he could, he could kind of pull off that like you know really really wealthy, but you know, but Reed Richards is a really smart scientist. Um, could he pull off the Human Torch? You know, Johnny Storm. Like, well, Johnny Storm's a little younger, maybe not. Right. Could he pull off one of the X Men? Could he be the new Wolverine? Could you know? Could he could be? He be I feel like he could be Gambit. Yeah, although we also know that they're trying to do a Gambit movie with Channing Tatum. So whether or not that's ever going to happen or not, who knows yeah. anymore? Because now also Disney owns it, not Fox. So that's a whole other can of worms. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, he also could maybe be Norman Osborn. Oh. And we could start seeing, you know, Green Goblin. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that could, could go on. For, that. I mean, there's just... There's so many possibilities. Right. Uh, I don't know. But just, man, I'm going to trust Kevin Feige to do the <laughs> right thing if, if he can get him. Because Kevin Feige's done pretty well so far these last 10 he years has. in the MCU. Yep. So. All right. Uh, yeah. Did you have anything else, Brie? No, I'm out. That's it. Okay. I, I do have one more. Okay. And this isn't a big... I mean, it, it's a big thing for me, but it's not... 
like a huge thing because there's not a lot of news around this. A while ago, Super Friends, I talked about the Wheel of Time series that's being picked up uh, for Amazon. One of the things that needs to happen, obviously, is casting. And the first official casting news uh, has has been leaked out. And the character of Moraine Damadred, who is uh, like kind of the main leader kind of of the Aes Sedai that we see throughout the book series, uh, especially in the early books. Uh, she's kind of like the mentor to the, you know, to the group of kids that come out of the two rivers area in those books. Okay. Uh, she has been cast. It's Rosamund Pike. Oh, uh, yeah. you're probably going to know, you're probably going to know her from that movie, uh, Gone Girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a photo of her reading The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan, which is the first book uh, in the series of the 14 books. We know that we know that this is being cast now. They're starting to go through this. But the fact that they cast her role first is important to me because one of the things this book series shows is that there's this magic system, this one power, um, but it can only really be harnessed by women, and they're the ones that can safely control it. And so, like, the women in the series control a lot of power and are kind of the moving force for most things that kind of happen in this world. Uh, It kind of does seem kind of like a a flip on a lot of the traditional kind of fantasy tropes. And, and so the fact that they cast her because she is a very strong, very independent, very focal point of a character. And she's just this bad, a woman in the books. And I love that character. And so I think Rosamund Pike is great casting. I think she's going to be wonderful in that role. And so if you're a fan of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series and you've read it, uh, I'm assuming I'm just preaching to the choir here <laughs> and you're anticipating this. But if you haven't, I know it's a big commitment. I know it's 14 books and I know books like six and a half, like the like latter half of six, seven, eight, and the first half of nine can get a little slow. And then they pick up again. But the first five books and like the first half of six are really, really good too. Uh, kind of like, you know, go read them, super friends. You, you have to. I'm considering going back and going through them all again, uh, just because it is a very, very good story. And Robert Jordan is a really good world builder and there's big, huge cast of characters. Uh, but this is, this is happening. I'm exciting. I'm assuming we're going to start hearing news about this being, you know, filmed maybe towards the end of this year, early next year. I'm anticipating we're going to see a release sometime late 2020. Um, Not for sure on that, but anyway, it'll be cool to see. This is like the equivalent of hearing Game of Thrones from the Song of Ice and Fire series was being translated to TV for HBO. This is kind of on that same level for fantasy fans. The the Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series is a massive, massive series in the fantasy genre. Right. So, anyway, casting news, that's exciting. Nice. Yes, yes, indeed. And that's the last thing I have for Rebel Intelligence, Brita. All right. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about our question of the week from last week. So, Brita, last week, Matt Shaw, our brother-in-law, was on, and we talked about the idea of voluntarily having parts of your memory wiped in order to re-experience uh, some sort of media again, TV, video game, movie, book, whatever, it can't be your kids being born. <laughs> it can't be the day you're married because obviously everyone wants to do that. Do you have anything that comes to mind? Do you have anything that comes to mind, Brita, that you would voluntarily have wiped from your memory so you could experience it again? Um, That is a great question. And I knew you were going to ask me this. And I still am not 100% sure what my answer would be. I feel like Lost is definitely up there because yep. once you've watched it, you know all the twists and turns and things are going to happen and you know the ending. So that's that's a good one. Um, other than that, I don't know. I'm sure there's things out there that I absolutely love. You know, I think this is going to sound silly, but I think I would want my mind wiped for uh, the book, not the movie version, of The Count of Monte Cristo. Um, oh. That is my favorite book of all time. And I try and reread it every so often it's been a number of years since I've done it now, but it's so 
interesting and like intricate and all these plots and these people and how it intertwines and like just it's like it's a masterpiece like it just really is and it like blew my mind the first time I read it and I was like telling everyone you've got to read this book don't read the abridged because this is amazing da 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 so um yeah if I could go back and read that over again with not remembering anything that would actually be pretty awesome nice I like that yeah well, we got a couple responses we're going to get to. So we're going to start over on email like we always do, which is fortofnerd at gmail.com. All right. We're going to start with Peter Christensen. He says, Dear Nerds, Father's Day was nice for me. We're in Utah on vacation at Aspen Grove Family Camp in Provo Canyon. Nice. We had church outside, took a big nap, ate a roast beef dinner, good but not Traeger quality, <laughs> and went to bed early. I got to relax, listen to the roaring stream, and watch the sunset behind the mountains. That just sounds amazing. By Aspen the way. Grove is beautiful, and we should totally go there sometime. It's amazing. Mm, okay. He says, uh, goes on to say, I loved the tick in the 90s cartoon, but did not care for the Amazon version. I watched three episodes and just wasn't feeling it. The cartoon was so welcomely absurd and had ca- continuity between episodes that was rare for the time. In honor of Kumail Nanjiani, look up his bit on Call of Duty, and there's a a link I'll have to look at. He says, as far as media, I'd love to view again for the first time. My first thought was Fellowship of the Ring. I wasn't attached to the books like Spencer, but the movies were so much more real, more gripping and intense than anything I'd experienced. But since Spencer said that one, I'll add Iron Man. (laughs) I remember being so pumped that I drove home at 80 miles per hour. We called our Scion XB the Fun V for years. I had no idea what the MCU would become, but I knew that something special had just happened. I've loved a lot of movies since then, but haven't had that top of the world feeling since. Cheers, Peter Christensen. And then he follows up and says, P.S. I would love to also experience the Old Spice Hello Ladies commercials (laughs) for the first time again. Those are the Hello Ladies. I'm the man, your man, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Yeah. I smell like the oh. where you want your man to smell like or something or yeah the man your right. man wants D- to smell like or something. Y- yes, yes, those were those were good commercials and they were very viral at the time and they really caught real big. Yeah, but kind of like once you know once you've kind of seen them though. Yeah, then it's kind of over and done with. Yeah, uh, really good stuff, Peter. I I'll agree. Iron Man going back and not knowing where the MCU would go. I think that's a good pick. Uh, the old spice commercials. I I didn't even think of commercials yeah. as something. That's a that's a good call. I like that. Uh, thank you for that, Peter. Uh, let's go over to Facebook. We've got a few responses here. Caleb Albers. Uh, by the way, this is facebook.com slash Ford of Nerd. It says, "Okay, these are hard for me. All my TV shows that I've seen and all the movies I have or I watch have some level of rewatchability to them, like." I like movies that make you think like The Prestige or The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, both movies that I've gotten more and more out of. So I wouldn't want that progress gone. So to pick a show, maybe Breaking Bad. And for movies, I'm going to go with a movie that I'm not even a tiny bit ashamed to admit that I love. I watch it every time I'm sick, The Notebook. Nice. (laughs) I was going to pick either A Quiet Place or Infinity War, but going off the rules, I'd not be able to go into those theaters again, so I would lessen the experience I had in the theaters. I feel for video games, I would want the memory of any open world game erased so I could experience Skyrim again. I love this game to death, and I remember the first time I played it and experiencing the vastness of the open world model, and it just blew me away. Since then, a lot of open world games have come out, and I feel like Skyrim outshined them all in ways of my wonderment. So yeah, Breaking Bad, The Notebook, and open world games to experience Skyrim again. Skyrim again. Those are my picks. Not going to pick a book because I love rereading all the books I have ever read. I like that. I've never seen the uh, the Notebook, so it's I, it's I kind really of a know. chick flick. Sorry, Caleb. Yeah, it is, but no, it's, no, that's why I haven't seen it because I know it's a chick. But flick. it's really yep. good, and I understand why he likes it. I know a lot of people who love it, and it is very. I can see why you would want your mind wiped for that one. See, growing up, Has when I was ending. sick. I, I would always watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right. being from Chicago and the whole faking the sick thing. Like, that just always kind of got me and, and whatnot in the Chicago thing. And then it was the Goonies mm-hmm. and the Blues Brothers. Like, those were the three things that I used to watch a lot when I was sick or homesick, um, especially in high school. Notebook, yeah, 
No, I, I haven't seen that. So, uh, uh, Peter, I'll take my wife's word and your word on it that it's Caleb? good for, what did I say? Peter. Peter? <laughs> Caleb. Caleb, not Peter. Peter did not say the notebook. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Although knowing, Pe- knowing Peter, he's probably seen it. Um, <laughs> but uh, C- Caleb's the notebook. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, whatever, whatever you would want to experience again is the right answer for you. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to move on to, uh, Facebook from Christine Johnson Giffer. Hey, this that's is my, my mother in law. <laughs> Buckle up. She says, <clears throat> I haven't listened for a while, but when Brita told me Matt was going to be your partner in crime, I had to listen. The video game talk went way over my head, but it was fun thinking about what shows, books, movies, etc. I would want to experience again for the first time. My comments will probably be too long to share on the podcast, but it made me think about it, so here are my choices. Books. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Yes. Jane is a, a comic genius, and all her books are full of such funny conversations and situations. The first time I read Pride and Prejudice, I believe I was a freshman in high school, and I literally stayed up all night to find out how Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet were going to end up together. Extremely satisfying in every way. I never get tired of reading this book. Movies, I have two. The six-hour Pride and Prejudice miniseries produced by the BBC. The screenplay is so true to the actual dialogue of the book, the production so beautifully done, the music true to the period... And I feel I'm immense, immersed in this story. I've watched it so many times and read the book so many times I can practically quote the dialogue. Mm -hmm. My second movie choice is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I read The Hobbit in high school and read the trilogy sometime later. Jessie, her youngest daughter, and I listened to the BBC radio production on cassette (laughs) over several weeks driving back and forth to dance lessons in Glendive, which is like about an hour away. She says, and I I remember how much I loved this world. I feel like Spence does about the movies. Peter Jackson literally recreated the Shire and Middle Earth on film and in New Zealand. We visited the Shire here. Uh, He created it's truly like being in another world. And as soon as I hear the music of the first movie, I feel I'm transported to Middle Earth. Howard Shore's score is so brilliant, and when I hear any of the music, I get that feeling inside I can't explain, but makes me long to live in the Shire with the Hobbits. I love it so much. (laughs) My TV series would be Stranger Things. I've seen a lot of great TV over the last 50 years, but this is one of the best. I love all the Masterpiece Theater productions of classic books, but Stranger Things is so crazy and fun and just enough scary. MASH would be a close second. I watched the reruns so many times I could quote the dialogue. After listening to this episode, I've queued up a couple of new series to watch. Friday Night Lights for one. Thanks, guys. So, a couple things here. Yes. Friday Night Lights is definitely worth watching. Chris, you definitely should watch that. I think you'll enjoy (laughs) it. I'm trying to convince Brita to watch it, and I don't know what's going to take to get her to watch it, but she needs to watch it. Uh. I, I'm with you on the Lord of the Rings stuff. I think that's great. The Stranger Things too. I think that's a good pick yeah. for TV. As far as your book and your movie choice, I really kind of feel is the exact same thing. And I've never read nor watched these two things. Once again, this falls into the category of the notebook that Caleb, not Peter, Caleb, uh, <laughs> was talking about. Jane Austen to me always strikes me as kind of, chick flick material kind of books that are geared towards women that now that's probably just me being completely sexist yes but i am <laughs> but i am who i am and i'm I'm not going to change that i just i personally don't have any desire to read it and every single time i've walked into a room when someone's watching pride and prejudice or most of the jane austen adapted films uh or whatever i just yeah it's just i i that time period, that kind of Elizabethan England Regency era. time period, yes. whatever. Uh, it it just doesn't speak to me. It just doesn't hit me. Sure. Um, if if dragons or goblins or long swords were involved, then I would probably stick around and pay attention. But I don't see Mister Darcy slaying goblins, trying to defend Elizabeth Bennet, uh, while a dragon is swooping overhead. I don't think that that's there. Sure, it's not, and I don't expect you to understand that. And I'm not going to go through my whole Jane Austen diatribe. I promise. But I do have to say, um, I love that my mom mentioned the movie as well as just the book because when that. A uh, six-hour miniseries came out on A&E. So it was an hour, like a 50-minute episode a week. 
And you had to wait for the next one the next week. This is old school people, how you used to have to wait to watch everything and you couldn't just download it on iTunes or whatever. And we had to record it. My mom and I would watch it every, I think it was like a Saturday night or on Sunday that it was on. And we would record it on our VCR and have that VHS tape and rewatch it through the week while we waited for the next one to come on. And this was my first experience with Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice. And it was just like, I loved that experience. And with my mom. So it was awesome. So I love that she put that. Well, good. Well, thank yeah. you, Chris, for once again for writing in. It has been a little while. Uh, let's move over to Twitter where you can find us at Fort of Nerd. So Rich Turpin at Turpin Rich says, none. I love reading or watching for the first time. And I love remembering what I thought and how I felt. So that's a solid no experiences erased to experience again for the first time, hmm. which it's interesting because, you know, Rich may not be wrong. There may be lots of people that wouldn't want to experience something over again. Um, you know, they want to keep those memories. And that's that's totally legit. That's totally fine. Uh, I do think, though, that kind of breaks the rules of what would you be willing to have your memory wiped for. <laughs> but that's okay, Rich. You're a good friend and we won't wipe your memory. Uh, maybe of the conversation we just had, but nothing. Uh, anyway. Uh, Cal and Jay at from the bottom 504 says Grand Theft Auto. So they would be willing to wipe their memory so they could replay Grand Theft Auto again and, and experience that. They don't specify which Grand Theft Auto because there's been numerous games in the series. Maybe they mean the entire series. I don't know, but I do know that fans of that, of that series and of those games love them to death. All right. Uh, over on Twitter again, we got burn a hyphen Excelsior at Dante's underscore Belmont. He says, I'm against the general idea. There's no guarantee you will experience that moment the same way. Ahem, 51st dates. That's a good, good point. point. He says, that said, Jurassic Park and the scene where the park doors open uh, and the music, he says, that. I want that. It's a similar at Universal Orlando with those doors. Yeah. I do like that idea. I mean, Jurassic Park was a big spectacle of a movie, and it did some things for the time, like 1993, that just we hadn't seen the CGI dinosaurs and the the way the the theater rumbled when the big footsteps of the T-Rex approaching, you know, come and you see the water ripple across the surface and you could feel your chairs or rumble like, that that moment was magical to me at the time. I remember I was about, you know, 14 years old when that happened. And I remember going like, oh, my gosh. Like, I remember looking over my shoulder thinking something was coming from behind me. It, it felt real. It was really kind of that start of the, hey, we're going to use audio in movies to give you this 360-degree feel that it really hadn't been in movies like that up to that point. Right. So that that's a really good really good one uh and then someone else on twitter and i don't have it up in front of me but they they did specifically said like hey remember the movie paycheck with ben affleck where he's this kind of you know a guy that's an engineer and he takes someone else's tech and he finds a way to like reverse engineer it and so the comp so this you know competitor can knock it off make it for cheap or whatever and then he has his mind like erased of what he just did that job so that he can never be a liability mm, and be held, it can be yeah. held against him. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that movie. And I, I think I have that on DVD. So kind of along the similar veins. I mean, I don't know that anyone would really want to experience that movie again for the first time and, you know, make that choice, but kind of a, a similar, similar idea in a movie form. So anyway, super friends, that is all the answers we have time for this week. Thank you so much for, for writing in and getting those to us. We really appreciate uh, interacting with you. Brita, how can the Super Friends help us out this week? Uh, they can share us on social media. They can send it out on the webs. They can go like us on uh, Instagram and Facebook and things like that. Also, go to iTunes. Give us a review. Five stars if you think we're worth it. Tell somebody about us. You know, help us out. Steal their phone and subscribe. Yeah. That's the new one now. I like that one. 
Yeah, that's that's how we do it. Are you subscribed, by the way? Do I need to steal your phone? I'm, I'm, I am subscribed. <laughs> nice. Good, good. Subscribed. All right, super friends. So for our discussion this week, we're actually going to be doing a movie club, and we're going to talk about Toy Story 4. And I'm going to preface this by saying this movie just came out. And so we're going to try to go as spoiler light as we possibly can. Yes. However, we do run the risk of having some spoilers for the movie. We're going to do our best, though, not to do that. Um, This isn't a movie like Avengers Endgame where you're not going to be able to talk about it and, you know, not talk about what happens in the plot because obviously everything in that movie revolved around the movie previous. Toy Story 4 is a little less, you know, intense and hangs on the events of the previous things. So we are going to try to be as spoiler light as we can. Right. That being said, you have been warned. There could be spoilers from this point on. So, Brita, you went and saw Toy Story 4 on Thursday of last week, correct? For some sort of work function? On Friday, yes. Friday. Yes. I got invited to, uh, yeah, just like a work event, uh, an appreciation, whatever thing. And so I got to go um, see this movie before any of my family or my children. (laughs) Yeah, which is one of the reasons why I decided then to go see it Saturday night. Because I was like, well, if we're going to talk about this, I need to go see it. And I don't want to wait another week or whatever. And uh, this is one of those movies where I thought we were going to take the boys opening weekend. Mm -hmm. But you had made a deal with them to take them to go see some other movie that then got pushed back a week due to some behavioral issues yes. on the boys' part. Yep. They had to earn it back. So I gave them the choice last week or the week before that they could either go see Secret Life of Pets 2 that week or they could go see Toy Story 4 the next week. And, you know, children, they don't know. They can't wait for something better. So they pick what's right then. So they picked Secret Life of Pets 2. So that's what we ended up watching, which, frankly, I just didn't even care for. So they yeah, don't get so, to see Toy Story 4 till next week. Yeah, they got they got to wait a little bit more. They got to earn it. Yeah. Uh, so Toy Story 4, this is an interesting film for me. We we had Toy Story 3 in 2010. That was the last time we had a a major uh, theatrical release for Toy Story because between then... We've had a few of the kind of the shorts. We had the Small Fry and Party Saurus Rex and what Toy was the Story other of one? Terror. Yeah, th- well, that was a little bit longer. Toy yeah. Story of Terror and the Toy Story that Time Forgot. Those mm-hmm. were like half hour ones, but like Small Fry and Party Saurus Rex and oh, there was one other one. Yes, like and- those are all like like little eight minute like really kind of mini shorts. Right. Um. So we have seen other stuff Hawaiian in the vacation. Toy Story world. Sorry. That's what it there is. You go. Yeah, Hawaiian <laughs> vacation. We we have seen other stuff in kind of the Toy Story world. Right. But this is the next theatrical release. It's been nine years since the last one. Uh what's interesting is that Disney had made some projections that they thought this movie was gonna make hundred and forty million domestic in its opening weekend, and it came out around hundred and twenty million. Mm. So it didn't quite meet the the expectations that Disney thought that it was going to hit, but still $120 million for an animated movie in its opening weekend is not a bad haul. Right. I mean, that's still some, I mean, that's legit still money. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's after nine years, I think there's a lot of expectations for how this is going to go. Um, let me ask you this toy story three. Yeah. And toy story three, the way it ends for me kind of felt like this was like the emotional goodbye to the series and it has some really kind of impactful emotional moments. And then we see the kind of the baton being handed off at the end of toy story three, where pretty much all of Andy's toys uh, are given to Bonnie. Right. Did you think that they were going to make a toy story Four after the end of three? I didn't for a couple years until they announced it. <laughs> it felt like that was a good place to end. And then they had some of those shorts come out and I thought, oh, this is a good way to do this. Instead of making a full length feature going forward, just do these little shorts every once in a while or half hour specials, which frankly, I really love. I think they're very clever and entertaining. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So it took four years in 2014 at an investor call 
uh, Disney and Bob Iger basically said they were going to make another Toy Story movie. Mm -hmm. And then it took five years from that moment to now when the, when the movie came out. My concern going into this movie was that how do you pick up after the events of the third movie and how do you tell some sort of compelling story that's going to you know, capture audiences and make them want to come in? I felt like this movie actually did a pretty decent job of doing that. Right. Essent essentially, and w without trying to give away a ton of stuff, you see a lot of this in the trailer, um, Bonnie, Bonnie creates a new toy. It's a spork that she glues some googly eyes and some pipe cleaner on and names him Forky. And Forky has an existential crisis. He thinks he's supposed to be trash, right. a single use and thrown away. And now he's a toy and doesn't understand that, you know, he's meant to be played with and, you know, to be loved by Bonnie. And Woody's trying to help him come to grips with this. Right. Which in a way is kind of a reversal of kind of like parts of the first Toy Story movie where he's trying to help Buzz understand that he's a toy, not the real Buzz Lightyear. And in this, he's trying to convince a created toy that he's a toy. He's not trash. Right. Which I kind of thought was interesting. Uh, it gives Woody kind of something to do. It kind of helps this, you know, this kind of notion, uh, you know, is part of a driver of the plot. But then kind of the other subplot is Woody, Woody kind of has a crisis of his own where he, he made a choice in the past and he ends up getting presented with that choice again in the movie and he has to decide who he really is as a toy is, is he still the toy he's been this entire time or has he changed? How did that kind of theme hit you, Brita, when you watched the movie? Well, I wasn't surprised because I feel like it's the same choice that Woody makes in just about every single movie um, that he's, you know, fighting for his belief in who he is and what his purpose is. And um, it was interesting how things kind of start to change a little more in this movie. And Woody starts to change a little bit because he's realizing, you know, maybe he's not who he thinks he is anymore. You know, maybe he's changed now and things have changed enough for him that he needs to make a new decision. Um, and that's what this movie is about, is him trying to figure out, you know if he is so focused on one purpose and if he needs to stick with that or if it's time to, you know, choose something different. So I thought, and and you tell me where you came down this, I thought that this movie really had a more adult theme to it. Absolutely. Not adult in, not adult in like a, you know, like you've got to be 18 or over in order to understand this, or no. there's like, you know, harsh language, but just more of like more adult themes, more complex ideas. Now, I felt like the other Toy Story movies had those elements as well, but also had a lot of stuff for the kids in there. Right. And I felt like this one, because I was thinking about that, like, how are the boys going to like this? You know, what are they going to think about this? And I think that there's less stuff for kids in this movie than any of the other Toy Story outings so far. Yeah, I think as far as the visuals and quote unquote physicality of the movie, the kids are going to enjoy that kind of stuff and the look and things that are happening. Um, but as far as like the actual story and dialogue and everything goes, I've been basically what I've been telling people when they ask me how it is, I say it's more of a parent movie. Yeah. Not necessarily adult, but it's a in a parent movie. It it there's definitely more like parent type humor, parent themes. There's like this is a movie um let like you say it's a a little bit less for the kids oddly. Um but there's and, and, still and things I think they'll thing. enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we pretty much get all the returning voice actors uh, from the previous movies, Annie Potts does come back to reprise her role as Bo. Yep. She was not in Toy Story 3. Yep. Um, we do have the voice acting 
of Don Rickles that was used from archive footage and stuff that he's done uh, as Mr. Potato Head that was in this. The only downside was is when they when we kind of heard that they were going to do this, I thought he was actually going to have more dialogue in the movie than mm. than he did. I felt like he only had like two or three lines and they were all very kind of generic, you know, right. hey, I'm just kind of throwing out something in agreement or in disagreement with kind of a in a kind of a crowd scene. Yeah. And maybe that's also that they didn't want to try to give him too big of a role because that would be really hard. But right. if you didn't know that Don Rickles passed before the filming and the dialogue started being recorded of this, I don't think you would know. Yeah. Yeah. Which So, I mean, the technology that we've t- kind of talked about, I thought was really, really good. Um, but we do get a couple new characters. We get Ducky and Bunny. Uh, that's, you know, uh, uh, Keegan-Michael Key and uh, Jordan Peele. Um do the voices of Ducky and Bunny. We also get a character named Gabby Gabby, which is done by Christina Hendricks. Mm-hmm. Um, we get Duke Kaboom, which is voiced by Keanu Reeves. Yes. Like I said, Keanu's having a good time right now. Um, <laughs> and then there was a couple others. We got um, this little girl named Harmony that gets introduced. Uh, Bonnie's dad is in this film. Yeah. It's Previously, the first time we've seen only. Him. Yeah, previously we've only seen her mom, mm-hmm. uh, but then everyone else comes back. I mean, you got Tom Hanks, and you got um, Tim Allen, Tim Allen, and you've got uh, Bonnie Hunt, and you know Joan Cusack, mm-hmm. and oh, uh, what's the guy's name that does uh, the Rex? It's um, oh, I know uh, Wallace Shawn. You got John Ratzenberger as Ham comes back. I mean. Carl Weathers plays Combat Carl again, which he was introduced in one of the little shorts. So you get a lot of all these, you know, re- kind of returning characters, which is really good, which I thought is smart because it helps with the continuity. If other voice actors had played these characters, sure. you know, whatever, it would have been kind of real hard to do. Um, the movie for me. I thought it was cast gr- great because it's basically bringing back all the other people. And I thought it was, you know, uh pretty great casting, but the biggest addition I would say is the character of Forky, which is played by Tony Hale. Mm-hmm. And I know Tony Hale's voice so well from, you know, so many things, but obviously Buster Bluth from Arrested Development, uh, Gary Walsh on Veep that like this moment I heard, it, I'm like, Oh, Hey, that's Tony Hale. I'm like, nice. You right. know, and I thought he did a really, really good job because he did have to carry a lot of scenes um, with him and Tom Hanks. Right. Yeah, I think he did. I think he did a great job. He really had that, like, confused, innocent voice that Forky has, you know, which is Tony Hale. But it's also like he's very much does a good job playing that character and is just confusion and just kind of like blind blissful innocence uh, that he has no idea what's happening most of the time with a little neurosis yes. added in there yeah absolutely so i i thought i thought it was acted really well i mean voice acted really well mm-hmm. uh let me ask you a question music yeah so i know that there was two new original songs that were written uh, the ballad of the lonesome cowboy and i can't let you throw yourself away did you notice any of those new songs? I actually didn't. I I didn't. I don't think I really paid attention to the music at all in this one. Like I heard some of the, you know, original themes and stuff playing a little bit. Um, but now I'm thinking about it. I don't actually remember the music at all for this one because they didn't have like a singing song like they've had in most of them. I mean, they did do another version of "You've Got a Friend in Me," sure. which they play in all the Toy Story movies. But I kind of thought the same thing too. Like I, I went and looked through the, the track listing, for the music, and I went, yeah, there's some new stuff that they put in here, but for me, the music didn't have as big a role in this film as some of the other previous films. Right. So I just was curious if you if you picked up on that or any of those really stood out to you or not. No. Which is kind of disappointing because I like anytime you hear the music from the other movies. Um, like, you know exactly what the kid, if a song comes on, um, the kids know exactly, they're like, oh, it's Toy Story 3 or, oh, this is from Toy Story 2. They know each of those songs. And I don't think there'll be one that they really associate with this one. 
Yeah. Um, currently, Toy Story four. It's in theaters. I mean, it was just it's barely been out you know, opening weekend, but currently has a ninety eight percent approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's scoring really, really high with the critics, and it's also scoring really, really, really high with the fans. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are saying that you know they they thought that it was you know pretty amazing that they found a way to tell a story that you know was different in a way and engaging. Um, but also still kind of had that nostalgia feel for the series and kind of had the touching kind of heartwarming moments. So this movie's getting a lot of great press, a lot of great buzz. The critics love it. Um, even though it didn't hit Disney's anticipated money mm-hmm. that they thought it was going to hit domestically, I think that this movie's going to go on to make quite a bit of money, both here and overseas. Yeah, especially I'm sure. as we're rolling into the Fourth of July. Yeah, yeah, I think you know families always love to have a Disney movie that they can go see, especially especially something that's trusted like Toy Story that you know kind of what you're going to get when you go, and you know that it's going to be appropriate for your kids and for you know it's something good that the parents will enjoy and the kids will enjoy at the same time, which is not always easy to do. Yeah. So here's a little bit of tidbit. Tom Hanks went on the Ellen DeGeneres show and said that that he is claiming that this is going to be the final film in the Toy Story franchise. Okay. Now, with that being said, in 2010, after Toy Story 3 released, and for the next four years, the producers, the writers of Toy Story 3 said that was going to be the final film in the franchise. So here's my question. The idea of toys that come to life when the kids aren't there, this story or some version of this story and these characters, I think, could continue to live on for a long time. Tom Hanks says this. Obviously, he's one of the voice actors, but he's not the one that's deciding at Disney whether or not they, you know, make another one. Do you think that Disney could potentially continue to milk this franchise for money for a long time to come? I mean, I think if they want to, they absolutely can. I I think it's time for Toy Story to be done. Um, I'd be okay, like I said, if if they continued with some of these. The way that it ended, there are some characters who could continue and do some of those short stories and things like that, and we could get a glimpse of what they're doing now and things like that. Um, however, I I don't really want there to be another uh, full length feature after this one. I I like. I like and dislike how it ended. <laughs> I'm still sort of like stuck with that one. I don't really know. But it ended in a way that I think uh, changes a very specific relationship. I'm trying not to do spoilers, guys. Changes a very specific relationship in the movies that is very important to uh, the show, to to these movies and this story. And so I think, I don't think I would enjoy it as much if it went forward without that. Okay, that makes sense. It's interesting that you say you think that there could be some spinoffs from some of these characters because yeah. there actually has been some spinoffs already announced. Oh, really? So there's going to be a 10 episode short series called Forky Asks a Question <laughs> that's going to that's going to exclusively uh, be on Disney Plus streaming service when it launches November 12th okay. of this year. There's also going to be a short film titled Lamp Life which is going to kind of reveal Bo Peep's whereabouts uh, between the events of Toy Story 3 and Toy Story 4. Oh, awesome. Yeah, because she is an interesting also, story. Yeah, that'll also be over on Disney+. Plus. Okay. So we're going to get some spinoffs. To me, that makes a lot of sense if they don't go the full feature length um, film route because, I mean, it's like Party Saurus Rex. Mm-hmm. Like that little short is one of my favorites. It focuses on Rex, which he's obviously one of the supporting characters of the series. Mm -hmm. But it's an amazing, like, eight-minute short. It's one of my favorites. I love it to death. And it doesn't have really, like, Buzz and Woody and, you know, Andy. And, and like, you know, they can do some of these other ones. Obviously, we're not going to get a Mr. Potato Head anything. Right. At least not with Don Rickles. So I, I see them staying away from that. Yeah. But I definitely think there are opportunities like this, you know, thing with Forky and like the thing with kind of Bo Peep between three and four uh, that could happen, which I think is a great idea. It's a great way to extend that 
and had put out more content that the kids could watch. I also could see them continuing to do those like 30 minute shorts right. with Bonnie having adventures with the toys. Mm-hmm. Because I thought that the both the ones they've done so far, the little bit bigger uh, shorts, the Toy Story that Time Forgot and the Toy, Toy Story, Story of, Terror. of Terror, I thought those were both really, really good. Oh, yeah, those actually, I love watching those. Like, they're a great little quick thing and they're really entertaining. And for those of you who have seen them, pay attention in the movies because there are Easter eggs for all of these shorts in yep. this movie. And... I was like laughing and my friend sitting next to me was like, what's so funny? And I was like, you had to have seen the shorts and you've never seen them. So pay attention for that. But yeah, absolutely. I agree. I would love to see some more of those little like half hour special shorts um, that focus on some different characters. And, you know, like the one kind of focused on Jesse and then the Toy Story that Time Forgot focused on Trixie, who was a new character and um, some of those things. I would think I would I would love that. All right, so let's talk our criticisms of the film here, okay. which ad- admittedly are not a lot, no. but there is one, and I think you and I kind of share this. So here's my problem with this. We have a really good, I feel, kind of closing ending at the end of Toy Story 3. Right. We've had this big emotional gut punch moment where the toys are staring down their own demise and then they get rescued, and then we see a passing of the torch from Andy to Bonnie, and that just the movie seemed to be perfect for like, hey, let's close up shop here, and you know we're going to be done with feature films. Right. Then nine years later, we get this film. Yeah. And for me, this is one of those things where, because it felt like such an a good ending to find a way to come back and tell another story, which I do think they did well and well enough. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that, you, in my, in my opinion, you're going to have to tell and do a couple more feature length movies. You can't be like, Hey, we had this real big kind of ending and now we're going to do another movie and then have kind of an ending at this one and kind of make it feel like we're wrapping the series up again. Cause now we're getting into the whole like return of the King, like multiple endings kind of feel. Right. And I felt like the story was really good, but knowing what had happened previously, I took in some expectations into this film that I was going to compare it to where it falls in with the rest of the series. And for me, there were some parts of it that kind of fell flat. I felt like the way that it ends and they kind of wrap it up, If this had been on its own, if this movie had taken place before three, which I know wouldn't really kind of work out because of some of the plotting. Right. But if, but the whole idea of like, if you could have taken this story and changed some of the Toy Story three story enough to make the, you know, switch them in the timeline and this movie would have came before three, I think it actually would have fit a lot better in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, I kind of went, Three had a more complete emotional ending that felt more authentic and resonated with me a lot better than this one did. Right. Did you have that? Did you have that? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I I definitely feel like three ended things just in a in a better way. Like it just felt more. You felt more closure. Because you felt like everyone was where they're supposed to be and this was, you know, it. I mean, in that one, I mean, it just made me cry at the end. Like, happy and sad crying all at the same time. This one, I did get emotional at the ending, but I felt like it was almost a little rushed. Like, there wasn't enough time to make the decisions and everything and it just... It kind of, that kind of bugged me how they did that. I wish there'd have been a little bit more, not that I need a drawn out ending, but I I needed a little bit more closure on this one because of the way that it ended. Um, and that's, that's the only thing that really bothered me about that. Um, yeah, I can't really say too I, much I, more without spoiling stuff. I agree. Stuff. <laughs> I agree. I think the closure at the end of three was better than the closure at the end of four. Yeah. 
And so, like I said, if four could have came before three, I think that would have been better. Um, however, that's a little unfair because we should look at this movie kind of on its own merits sure. and, and not kind of compare it to like, you know, how it could have been better necessarily, how it could have fit in better. And like just objectively looking at this movie on its own, if Toy Stories one, two, and three and the shorts hadn't existed and we just got this movie, I would have said, this is a, re- this is a really good movie on its own. It stands up. It is a really good movie. Yeah. All the way through, I thought the pacing was really good. I thought the introduction of characters were good. You know, it didn't have to spend a lot of time, you know, trying to tell a lot of backstory and you know, getting super complicated to introduce characters. I thought it, it did all that really well. Um, I really like the movie on a whole by itself. It's when I judge it in kind of the whole series, I kind of go, eh, it, it seemed rushed at the end. And it didn't have as an emotional impact that it could have with the closure. It just kind of seemed like all that kind of happened real kind of quick. And then it was like, okay, and now we're at the ending. And so that's my one kind of criticism with this movie. Right. But that's still like not a huge criticism. No, I mean, I mean overall, I really enjoyed this movie. I, I liked the new characters that they introduced. Um, and there was quite a few of them. I, I, I was sort of frustrated that they didn't focus. There wasn't as much like Woody and Buzz stuff happening or like we just didn't see as much of the traditional characters that we'd been following. Like even the new Bonnie characters um, of her toys and things like that. It focused a lot more on on toys outside of uh, Bonnie's world and sphere. Um, right. Which was good because, I mean, that – that made the story make sense um, in, in the overall of what they were trying to do. So I, I did like that. And I liked um, Christina Hendricks character, Gabby, Gabby. She has an interesting arc um, and how she comes around. And I know everyone's, you know, skeptical on how Bo Peep is going to perceive. Is she a good guy? Is she a villain? You know, when you see the previews, you're just not quite sure. Um, and I think she does a great job in, um, Annie Potts did awesome with her and, and reliving that character and bringing her back to life and the story that she goes through and her arc that we see as well. And, um, her influence and everything on Woody is very interesting. So there's definitely a lot of things I really love about this movie. There was some definite laugh out loud moments, um, that I really enjoyed. There are some awesome, like I said, Easter eggs for those who've been paying attention to all the little shorts and things and the whole series. Um, so there is there's a there's a lot of good and there's just a couple things that I'm like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure about. I'll see it again. I'll probably come to terms with it. Okay. So let's uh kind of wrap this up here a little bit. Would you recommend the Super Friends go see this? Would you recommend kids go see this? Would you not recommend? Like, where's your going to be your recommendation here on this movie? I, I still think everyone should go see it. I think everyone will enjoy it. Parents will definitely enjoy it going with their kids. Um, I think our kids are still going to like it a lot. Um, and they're little and they'll understand most of the story. They won't understand some of the humor and things, but they're going to love the ducky and bunny characters. Oh, for they're sure. They're going to love them. I mean, those were made for the I mean, nine and under crowd. It's it's key and peel. I, know. I mean, it, a com- comedic duo right yes, there. Yes, and their craziness that they have, <laughs> and there's just some funny stuff. They're gonna love love the carnival and all the things that 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 entails. So there's a lot of that. Um, I still believe that uh, uh, what are those dummies called? The uh, ventriloquist the dummies. Benson's. Yeah, the Vincents yeah. or whatever the ventriloquist dummies are freaking terrifying. Even in a cartoon, they freaked the heck out of me a couple of times. So, <laughs> really, oh my gosh! But I have a real issue with uh, ventriloquist dummies because as a kid, like I read the Goosebumps book, The Night of the Living Dummy, and I'm terrified of ventriloquist dummies now. <laughs> so that freaked me out. <laughs> okay. Super, super friends. If you have a ventriloquist no. dummy, send Don't. it my way. Um, <laughs> so I would definitely recommend this movie to anyone, uh, that's enjoyed the Toy Story series, that enjoys Pixar movies, or that just wants to kind of have a, a family kind of friendly movie night, uh, either by yourselves with a significant other or with children if you have them. Mm-hmm. 
it is a good time. It is a lot of fun. Uh, I really, really did enjoy the movie on its own. So I'd say that, you know, it's, it's cleverly written. It's, it's smart. It's funny. Go see this. Um, so Brita, my question of the week is going to be a little bit different because I want it to be about Toy Story, okay. but I'm not going to be asking about plot and I'm not going to be asking about things because there's a lot of sure. super friends that may not be able to get out and see this right away. Yeah. So people always talk about spirit animals oh. and what spirit animal they would represent, you know, represent or would represent them or resemble or whatever. Mm-hmm. So if you were to pick one of the toys from Toy Story that you think best aligns with your personality, what toy would that be? Oh, that is a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer. Um, I think most likely probably Trixie, the Triceratops from Bonnie's room. She talks a lot and says you got that right weird things sometimes <laughs> i know teasing. thank you and she's just <laughs> like just a little teasing. like crazy and like just i don't know she she just i don't know i just love her <laughs> i just think i'd want to be her i feel i feel like she resembles me in some ways okay i like that um i was thinking about this i think i'm gonna go with woody for me and the reason being is that woody is like very loyal to his friends, very loyal to Andy, to Bonnie. And like, I'm, I'm very loyal to like my family and my friends and those that I care about. And I want to be there for them at all time. And like family and that sort of thing, like that really hits home with me. Like I really do take that to heart. And that's tried kind of how I try to live my life is to be loyal to those people that are close to me. Also throughout the series, you could see that Woody kind of struggles with change and he tries to do his best to kind of control change and manage it. And sometimes good, sometimes not. And I kind of feel like that's also kind of me. Like I really try to keep things in order. And when things start getting kind of out of control and crazy, I try to take a tighter rein on the situation and like try to normalize it some. And so I feel like a... Like Woody would be the toy that best represents me or I best represent the toy, however you want to look at it. Nice. There's other ones I wish – there's other ones I wish I could say. Like I really love Rex, but Rex is like a really neurotic know. individual and that's just not me. I considered that too and I'm so, like, I'm not that neurotic. <laughs> yeah, me, me neither. But anyway, so you're going to go with Trixie the Triceratops. Yeah. I'm going to go with Sheriff Woody. I think those are – Really good answers for us. But Super Friends, I want to hear from you. Which toy from Toy Story, and it could be any of the toys, best represents you, your personality? Let me know at all the normal places. That's going to be Facebook, which is facebook.com slash Ford of Nerd. Twitter at Ford of Nerd. Instagram, Ford of Nerd. The voicemail, you can call in 801-477-7687 or you can always write it in email form, and that is fortofnerd at gmail.com, and we will read those answers next week. Brita, once again, thanks for coming on the podcast. Always a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me back. And uh, we're going to be doing this again real soon because we've got Spider-Man coming up, Yeah. and we also have Stranger Things coming up, yeah. and so, so we're going we're gonna to have a lot of quote unquote movie club episodes in a very short period of time this summer. You guys are going to get real sick of me. No comment. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Anyway, super friends from all of us here at the Fortress of Nerditude to all of you out there, wherever you may be, may the force be with you always.